Hello, all you beautiful people of the great free state of New Hampshire. Welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. I'm so happy to be with you. And I'm super, super, super excited because I realized yesterday that today, being episode 36 of the Carla Garrick Show, uh, it came up in my Facebook memories that it has been dung, 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 one whole year of doing this insanity with you. So thanks to all the folks who are sticking in there and hanging out and uh, to everyone who watches this on Manchester Cable Access Television. I'm so glad you're still watching and uh, sticking with me through thick and thin. Today on the show, we're going to be talking one about that sort of year in review, I guess. And then uh, I'm going to touch base just on some stuff that's in the news. I have another great op-ed to read, this one by Jody Underwood, um, sort of in defense of education freedom and school choice and just, you know, thinking a little bit outside the box. It doesn't have to be so scary. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Jane Cornell's voting record, uh, which is shockingly horrendously uh, bad, sorry folks, and um, and then maybe wrap up with uh, some stuff coming up in the free state this weekend. So first of all, um, I hope everyone is going to my website from time to time. If you go to carlagarrick.com, you will see I post almost every day. I'm either making content like these shows or where my natural inclination is, which is writing, because writing sort of helps me formulate my ideas so that I'm able to uh, do these shows on the fly, so to speak. Um, I actually realized yesterday, so first of all, you know, it popped up in my Facebook memories and I was like, wow, has it really been a year? Yes, I know. Then I was like, oh, how many episodes have I done? And I was like, well, 36 counting this one today because, you know, you always got to put a little bit in the, in, in the pockets for yourself. Um, and that surprised me. Now, not all 36 are, you know, just straight up content like this. Some of them were podcasts I've done with other speakers like Tom Woods or Lou Perez um, and Brian Nichols. So, you know, I did use a little bit of content from other places, but for the most part, it actually made me feel really good because I was like, well, I didn't quit. I'm still here. I'm trying. I'm not sure if I'm getting better, but I think I am a little bit. But in writing this blog post yesterday on my website, carlagarrick.com, I actually realized something, which is why I love journaling and why I would highly encourage anyone who is on a path to better self-actualization and self-realization and self-growth and really figuring out who you are, what you want out of life, what your life landscape looks like, what you need to do in order to get from here to there, and all of those stuff that people who have a growth mindset and who want to actually improve the world, not through force, not by telling everyone you got to do what I think is a great idea. Idea, but inspiring people to do it and to do it from the inside out because that is how true change works. So in writing this journal entry yesterday, I realized that I was raised sort of to be seen and not heard. Although, you know, I had I have an outgoing personality. I'm actually quite introverted as well. And, you know, when I'm home, I'm sort of focused inward. I love to read. I love to learn. I've never, I don't think in my entire life, had the notion that I'm lonely because I always feel like I can amuse myself. Um, and that's not me in the mirror amusing myself. I mean, just mentally, you know, going on a path to constantly be stimulating your brain. So in writing this, the see not heard thing really struck me. And I was like, oh, huh. And then I was like, oh, I wonder if this is part of the challenge I have. Like I have to psych myself up to do these because I kind of feel two things. One is I feel like I'm imposing on, on people by doing this. And two, I think I was taught that seeking attention, which is, I guess, what I'm trying to do, right? I would like people to subscribe and follow me and do all of that good stuff because they think I have important things to say. In fact, I know I do. Um, 
But that notion of being sort of this tension between the training I was given as a child, which was seeking attention is vain. It's not something you should do. It's wrong. And then this like burning desire to be like, hey, I have really great ideas and I want people to to flourish. And I think I have some tools to help make that happen. So in writing that down yesterday, that really did clarify something for me. So I think I'm down the path to sort of embracing this notion of this is okay. Um, I'm allowed to tell people what I think. You don't have to like it, enjoy it. You don't have to follow me, be the audience. You can switch your TV off now, or you can come around along for the ride. But my point is for me internally, it was an aha moment. And I was like, oh, okay. So let me grapple with this going forward. And I will, but I think it's going to be a liberating in the true sense of the word uh, experience because I was like, oh, was that what was holding me back? Gee, okay. Well, now that I understand what the issue is, I can work to improve the 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 outcomes and so that's what I'm hoping to do so with the 36 episodes I did a little mathy math but you know like Carla math and so I was like oh okay 36 episodes out of 52 weeks gives me a strike rate of 70 percent and I was like that's I mean that's uh I don't know in the states what that is is probably a b right or a b minus I don't even know in America or in South Africa it's uh that's a okay grade of course there everything was way harder and there were like literally only seven people in the country who got straight a's the year my husband Louis graduated and I know that because he was one of the seven so you know the smarts are around as we like to say so 70, so that's a 70% strike rate, 36 episodes out of 52 weeks. Then I was like, well, let's give ourselves a little leeway and we'll just make it a little lower. So I was like, well, we'll take four weeks off and pretend we're in France, right? So then I was like, oh, well, then I'm up to 75% strike rate. So anyway, why is that important? Just to motivate myself to feel like, oh, I'm hitting benchmarks. Because in my little mental Carla brain world over here, I'll be like, ah, oh, you're failing at everything you're doing. Why can't you do more, be better, go more places, do more stuff, you know? Which I think is a condition that we all suffer under because we are living in this like high frequency, crazy, crazy world. So, speaking about crazy worlds, first of all, do not get sucked into this whole nuclear war thing because um, I think it's a narrative. It is fear mongering. Of course, it's a terrifying notion, but don't let them drum that into our numb skulls because it's almost 100% not likely to happen. I'm actually pretty confident about that, regardless of Zelensky, a insane comedian who's friends with neo-Nazis, who everyone's now listening to, who actually yesterday was like, yeah, I think you guys should do a preemptive strike on Russia. That is crazy. So hopefully sane minds will prevail. uh, But don't let it become something that frightens you. That is their playbook. Spreading fear is part of the status toolbox. In fact, it is currently, I think, their number one tool. And so don't let them pollute your brain with things, one, that you cannot control. Not you or I sitting here in Manchester, New Hampshire, in the great free state of New Hampshire. We can control our neighborhoods, we can control our own actions, but we can't control whether there's gonna be a nuclear war or not. So stop worrying about it. If you hear it on the TV, switch it off. In fact, if you only do one thing for the next week, if you're still watching, mainstream legacy news. I don't know why you would be doing that. Notice the music they play. So that is a uh, very subliminal way that you're being influenced to feel anxiety, to ratchet up sort of fear and all of that. So when you start to actually notice it, when you start to hear that music as as a an awareness tool, then you can realize, oh, I should totally change the channel right now because someone is trying to change your own emotional state. So don't fall for it. Number two on the list of things that happen in the news is this pot pardon that 
President Biden tweeted about yesterday. So he's all like, you know what, folks, we're going to uh, suddenly take part of the Schedule 1, which, you know, of course, libertarians have been saying for literally 50 years or whenever it was scheduled. Um, so he's suggesting that it would be a pardon for simple marijuana possession on a federal level. So first of all, you're like, whoa, that sounds awesome. I know someone like me who's been working on this issue for a long time. I was super excited. And then I was like, wait a second. Are we being gamed? We are always, always being gamed by politician folks. That's just a reality. So it turns out this would only affect about 6,000 people who are currently in prison, in federal prison for pot. Because turns out, most pot stuff is done on the state level, as it should be, because most things should actually be on a state level. But be that as it may, a lot of people were like, wow, this is super exciting. Look at the president, you know. Now, you could be uncharitable, as I will be right now, and say that uh, this is a desperate ploy for a talking point where people aren't going to look at the details which is all true, which is why I'm telling you this isn't really going to help anyone. Um, it, it's a ploy to be in the news on an issue that would appeal to left-leaning voters and they're not going to go do their homework. And so they're going to be like, yay, the president decriminalized or legalized weed. Again, that is not what's happening. Here is what should happen. So, uh, Justin Amash actually tweeted this out this morning, and I 100% agree with this. First of all, it should be all nonviolent cannabis uh, convictions should it, should it should apply to all of them. So not just misdemeanors, but actually all cannabis convictions, right? All those convictions should be expunged, meaning if you had a pot weed record on your thing that goes off, um, off your, your status paperwork so you don't have to disclose it in order to get a job and all those things that we know create barriers to the workforce that also ends up creating more and more and more poverty, right? So let's uh, let's pardon all nonviolent cannabis offenders. We'll expunge all the convictions. Then we should end civil asset forfeiture, which is like literally the government stealing from people. If you don't know what this is, I will make this very short, but it's basically highway robbery by your government. So what they do is police departments are allowed to take your stuff without you ever, ever, ever being convicted of a crime. So, and then just take it. And then they use it for everything from margarita makers and blenders in their office to like speed boats that they keep around for them to play with. So it is, it is like, it's, 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 it's ridiculous on its, face and uh, we should end civil asset forfeiture. And then number four that Justin Amash said that I agree with is we should decriminalize all drugs on a federal level. Now this may sound crazy to you, but here's the argument. Again, America is a federation of states. There are 50 states. The idea was that the states would compete so that we can figure out what ideas work. What we have learned, and if you have not learned this through COVID, I can't help you, but it is that top-down control doesn't work because a lot of times government actually literally picks the worst of all the solutions, and then they lean into that. And that is the definition of insanity. I would much rather see hundreds of people experimenting, and then maybe a bunch of them are like, oh, clearly this one is working, so let's do this. Um, so that is the news on the pot pardons. Next, we are going to talk about Mr. Cayenne West. I think I'm saying that right. Probably I'm not. Anyway, he was on Tucker Carlson last night, and I have to say someone was like, oh, my God, who could have predicted Tucker and Cayenne? 
Kanye, 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 sorry. Okay, Tucker and Kanye uh, together on a show. And I was like, you know, the world's gotten so crazy. This may end up being a ticket in 2024. I hope that's not the case. But anyway, he did come out, you know, and there were some really great clips. You guys can go find them for yourselves. But, you know, he 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 wore that White Lives Matter t-shirt that made the internet explode. Uh, I think instead of focusing on his that choice, we should be focusing on the difficult decisions that he's trying to bring to the fore, difficult discussions that he's trying to bring to the fore. These are hard things that we have to grapple with and talk about. And one of those things is abortion. And he talks about Margaret Sanger, Sanger. She is the uh, the mother of abortions. She was the mother of Planned Parenthood. These are places that are generally only found in low income and black and brown communities. Um, there have been almost, I think, 80 million abortions within that community. So we have to be talking about this. Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. She is on the record. I know you don't want to hear this, but this is the truth. And what we got to do is grapple with the truth. So this brings me to Jane Cornell's voting record. Now, I'm afraid, folks, if you live in Ward 11 of Manchester and you are voting for her, you are voting for late-term abortions up to and including birth. That is wrong. I don't care where you fall on whether it should be here or here or whether life began or whatever. Although, I will tell you, even as someone who grew up in a very woman's lib environment and very much believe in self-ownership, so I do believe it should not be illegal. I don't think anyone should do it and we should explain to them why it's a bad choice. Uh, there, you know, should be an entire market for private abortions in a way that we're not doing uh, that could help people economically and all of that. But Jane Cornell supports abortion on demand with no limitations. Now I have, and this is, you know, like eight pages of voting records here, but here's the basics. This election is going to be about three things. It's going to be about energy costs, which the Democrats are desperately driving up. It's going to be about education, which we all know that the education system, the public government run schools in America are failing. Even here in New Hampshire, they are teaching CRT. There's shady stuff going on. People are being told if you're white, you're an, an oppressor just by the nature of your skin color, which on the face of it is racist. Um, so uh, energy, education, and uh, I forget what the other, economy, right? It's the economy, stupid. And so Democrats consistently, 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 undeniably vote against parental control or parental rights over their own children. So here is a decision you need to make for yourself. Do you think that parents are the stewards of their child's life? Or do you think some teacher owns your children or the state owns your children? And shockingly, when I get to Jody's little essay, uh, which I probably should jump into before we run out of time, um, the state of New Hampshire, the government of New Hampshire in a court case actually said, yes, we do think we own the kids. So if you're a parent and maybe you, you're, you're an independent and you're not sure, please vote for me this time and give me a shot to show you guys that we can change and reform and do things out of the box. Society's not gonna collapse. In fact, things are going to start to get better because everything we're doing right now is not working. Um, so the Democrats voted for policies that raise the cost of electricity and power. They've uh, voted for higher taxes. No one's talking about it this election cycle, but Democrats want to introduce an income tax in New Hampshire. On the flip side, Republicans actually reduce the uh, dividends and interest tax, and that will taper down to zero by 2026, which means this will be a true, true income tax free state, which is really exciting, which means we can attract wealth and uh, make New Hampshire even more prosperous because we're so lucky 
to live here and to live in this beautiful place uh, that we can continue to expand liberties because human liberty and freedom makes life better. All right, what else has she said? Yep, they're for taxpayer-funded abortions up to and even after birth. Uh, they're obviously against anything to do with gun rights or the Second Amendment or anything to defend your own family, even though we know the data shows that guns prevent crimes. They're against low- and middle-income families choosing the education option for their children, i.e. they're against school choice. All these people, by the way, send their kids to private schools. They are the biggest, 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 biggest hypocrites. Um, and then they're also against voter integrity and making sure that only New Hampshire residents vote in New Hampshire. All right, so I'm going to post this actual, her, her actual votes. So this is Patricia Cornell, who is the current sitting Democrat in Ward 11 of Manchester. If you think we can do better, please, please, please vote for me, Carla Garrick. Uh, this November, I, you know, I'm an open book. You can go look at my 10 years plus of content on my website. There are hundreds of videos. The word is out. So I think I'm going to, uh, to end with this. And then you should just also know upcoming this weekend in the free state of New Hampshire, our great, wonderful state with the best time of the year because the trees are turning and the landscape becomes like candy. October is my favorite color, as I like to say. Um, there is a ton, a ton of stuff going on. Apple picking, corn mazes, uh, poker parties, like, I mean, just everything that runs the gamut. And if you're interested in learning more, you can go to porcupinerealty.com. I believe, uh, anyway, just Google Porcupine Real, uh, Realty and you will find the schedule for this weekend. So here we go. Give what free staters advocate a chance. You might be surprised. And this is by Jody Underwood and it was in yesterday. Uh, so that's Thursday's union leader. Gurus he, who teach how to create institutional changes like to say that change happens in three steps. First, they ignore you. Then they fight you. Eventually, they think it's their idea. This beautifully illustrated. This is beautifully illustrated, but what by what happened in Croydon several years ago, when some free staters thought it would be a good idea to set up a town tuitioning program, which is one of the mechanisms for school choice in New Hampshire. That is, instead of sending all students in grade five through twelve to the failing Newport School District, Croydon would pay to send students to their choice of schools in the area, including some private schools. At first, the town's reaction was, yeah, sure, set up a committee to look into it. Once the town voted to put the committee's plan into action, the resistance began. Free staters wanted to destroy public schools. Parents can't be trusted to make the right choices for their children. Years later, the residents including many of those who fought hardest against it, now think of town tuitioning as central to Croydon's identity and critical to maintaining high property values. The town tuitioning program has been a source of several success stories. Some children who were barely surviving in their assigned schools were able to thrive when tuition to other schools, including a local Montessori school. Some parents were able to exercise more direct control over the values to which their children were being exposed, again, by choosing private schools, including a local religious academy. When the state tried to narrow the scope of the town tuitioning program, it was free staters who went to court to protect it. It was free staters who raised donations so that the town wouldn't have to pay any legal fees. And it was free staters who worked with the state legislature to shepherd a bill in onto the governor's desk, making it possible for any town to follow Croydon's league and lead in doing what is best for children. And since the private schools cost less than the public schools, let me repeat that, and since 
the private schools cost less than the public schools. It was better for Croydon's taxpayers. It's ironic that some of the parents whose children have benefited from town tuitioning precisely because it offered an improvement over the traditional way of doing things, recently led a fear and smear campaign against free staters for trying to improve the academic performances of students while spending less money. And that's just history repeating itself. There's an irrational fear propped up by name calling, that free staters are out to destroy public institutions when really they are just trying to make them work better. That is the lesson of town tuitioning in Croydon. And with many lessons, it may have to be repeated several times before it sinks in. Up next is changing how we think about fairness in education by switching the focus from school funding to student achievement. Once again, the resistance is fierce, but the outcome is inevitable. In New Hampshire, they say, if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes. No. Oh. Ah! Dismiss. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Just wait a few minutes. In New Hampshire, they say, if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes and you'll get something you like better. If you don't like what free staters are doing now, just wait a few years and you'll think it was your idea. All right, folks, that's it. I'm sorry for the little bell ringing here towards the end. Um, I'm still <laughs> figuring out all the tools. Uh, thank you for joining me for this one-year anniversary celebration of The Carla Garrick Show, episode 36. Check out my book on Amazon, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope Mostly. You can see a review of it on episode 35 last week. Uh, be sure to check my website, carlagarrick.com. I hope to see you, meet you out and about while I do some door knocking and just enjoy the, the fall here in our wonderful, wonderful state. Um, if you're looking for a few documentaries to watch, here are three I would uh, recommend. There's a new one out called Safe and Effective. It's out of the UK. It's Dr. Asim Mohaltra. Uh, it looks at UK data that has to do with vaccine harm. It was on YouTube last time I saw. Uh, check Ivor Cummings, uh, who did a lot of great work with numbers and data out of the uh, Ireland. He has a new documentary or a short 50-minute, 52-minute thing out called COVID Chronicles. You can find that, Ivor or Cummings, COVID Chronicles. And then um, there was an interesting in uh, lecture, I guess, by a professor, uh, Swedish, I believe, or Finnish, anyway, Nordic professor called The Shapers of the Future. And there he talks a little bit about some of the globalist agenda, so to speak. So um, again, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you guys next week. In the meanwhile, uh, Remember that you can subscribe, find me on Odyssey, find me on YouTube, follow me on Twitter. My Insta is full of just funny, great memes. Um, I'm on Facebook. And of course, always remember that together we can live free and thrive.